Hello, I'm Nadia Bilchik, and I've spent the last three decades of my life either in front of or behind a television camera. I started my career with MNET Television in South Africa and then moved to Atlanta where I worked for CNN International, CNN Airport Network, hosted various segments for CNN Weekend Morning Passport. And one of the highlights of that was when John Oliver featured me on his show using some of my segments talking about the World Cup. I always say we helped bring down FIFA. The reality is that my ability to communicate via a television camera has been absolutely critical for my career. But with our new virtual worlds, we all now have to learn to communicate via camera, and that is our computer camera. And there's certain skills that it requires to come across as authentic and confident and comfortable. And I'd love to teach you those skills. Because we think it's very easy to go from in-person to on-camera, the adaptation is a lot harder than we think. One of the things I get asked a lot is where you should look. And looking into your camera is a skill, but it's counterintuitive because you want to look down at the people who are speaking. So there's technique in being able to shift between the two. I have a green screen behind me, which is why the wonderful producer of this video has managed to key in some background. But you don't have to have a green screen, but is your background assisting you in coming across as credible and competent and knowledgeable? So please join me on my webinars and individual coaching on how you can come across with confidence on camera and really make sure that all your virtual interactions are collaborative and engaging. So go onto my website, which is nadiaspeaks.com. And I'm so delighted to have executive coach and trainer, Melissa Davies with me to talk about not only your virtual presence in front of camera, but Melissa, help us understand how to lead virtual and hybrid teams. So I know that introduction doesn't do you enough justice. So Melissa, how do you introduce yourself to people? Ah, that's an interesting question, Nadia. It's always wonderful to see you. Thanks for having me on. Um, you know, I guess one of the things I say to people is that my my mission on earth is to help others to uncover and work towards the greatness that is within them. Because I believe that we all have greatness. You know, I believe that we all have purpose and reason for being here. It's just that our greatness is different from one another. So it's not that zero sum mentality. I think we all have our potential to go for. And so you know, I, I believe that that's that's my mission is to help people to to achieve that, to understand what it is, and then to achieve that. And Melissa, in a virtual and hybrid world, how do we do that? How do we find that in others? So let's unpack for a moment. What are the obstacles that people are facing right now as they continue to lead virtually? What are some of the common things that thwart us being as motivating, as engaging as we need to be as leaders? I think part of it is empathy and really understanding what's going on in people on your team's lives. You know, we're not managing and leading the same way when we were in person. Things are different. Uh, because we don't know what's going on with folks at home. And, and I mean, who did you and I think we would be here a year and a half later talking like we are now? You know? I don't think people anticipated that the virtual world would have expanded. And the thing that I'm saying to my clients, and I'm sure you are too, is yes, the hybrid world may be something we inhabit, but the fact is the virtual component is not going away. So one of the things that I see people are having a challenge with is how do you onboard people virtually? So you're not getting to see them. They're not walking around the office. They're not meeting people. So what advice and guidance do you have for managers, leaders who are having to onboard new associates or new employees that they've never met in person? So I would say a couple of things. One is, so many of my clients work in a classified space or in an area where they don't have cameras. So they've had to actually get cameras that are external to the computer and activate that potential so that you can actually see folks. I've had people that I've been working with, employees who've said to me they've been working with the team for a year and they have never once met their manager or seen them, which is really tough. That I've, sounds foundational, but it's an important one. Yeah, and I have other clients who, what they've told me is that as managers, what they've done is, and this is in the government space, so people need cat cards, they need technology, they need the, what they're gonna be using, they meet them on site 
to get that foundation created. So they'll meet them a couple of times, two or three times actually on site when they're picking up their technology, they're picking up what they need so that they have that relationship. They'll go for coffee. They'll, they'll have a, an onboarding interview. They'll set them up with, in the military space, we call it a battle buddy. They'll set them up with a mentor or somebody that will work with them for not the first couple of weeks, but the first year. Somebody that they can call up and say, hey, Nadia, what, what's going on? Why are people acting this way? What's so different right now? Um, but I love the term battle buddy because I think whatever organization, company, industry you're in, if you're onboarding someone, give them a battle buddy. Yep. Give them somebody that they can have real conversations with about some of the anxiety they're experiencing. That's a good onboarding technique. Well, make sure that person wants to be a battle buddy. Because I've been around oh, mentors who have been volunteered, voluntold to mentor, and they're not good at it because they they will look at the person and go, well, I was given this role. This isn't what I chose. And that's not really what you want to do for people that are new to an organization. So, yeah, set them up for success. Have a chance to meet them. Um, you're going to have to do those touch points. You're going to have to find ways. And I know we're still in this space. I've got clients that said to me, I thought we'd be done by last summer. And here we are going into the second fall. And like you say, it's expanding. So I think personally, really finding out why do you need a hybrid environment? Do you truly need to go back on site? And if so, what's the reason for that? What you know, how what length of time do you need to be there? How many days a month do you need to be there? What is the purpose of being there? So you're intentional about those engagements and not, well, just because I need to see the whites of your eyes. If you're onboarding and the person is in another city to your team. Any advice and guidance on onboarding that individual? I would certainly invest in a camera. I would certainly invest in the ability to have a face-to-face -face session with folks and, and be able to set up times, not just not just the initial 30 minutes, but follow up weekly for a little bit and say, you know, what are what can I do to make you more successful? What are your successes this week? What are the things that you've had that you've stressed about? Be honest about it. Don't feel like you have to hide back on it. And then let's really have a conversation about how I can support your growth here. Um, I think that's a really good one. How can I support your growth? Then another thing is how do we create virtual ideation sessions? Sessions where we're asking people to come out with ideas and be creative. How do we encourage that and do that more skillfully in a virtual space? It's not so easy, is it? It's much more difficult. You have to be more intentional. Again, I, think I like to use the idea of breakout rooms. So divide and conquer. Put people into smaller groups, three, four persons in a room, as opposed to think we're going to have 15 and that everybody's going to contribute. Uh, I tend not to want to put people in groups larger than five because it's easy to hide in that space. Whereas if you're in three or four, you have more space to open up, to contribute, um, I also like the idea of using structured approaches. So we're going to use um, we're going to use a mind map for this, or we're going to spend a certain time using uh, a specific technique called cat woe. Like we're going to be very targeted. What is that technique called? It's called cat woe. How do you spell that? C a t w o e. C a t w o e. Okay, and you explain that to the group. Yes, and then you can do it virtually. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you have a structure for going through things. It's not just go into your room and fend for yourselves. So in right. the breakouts, you say either mind map, you teach one person how to facilitate the mind map. That's a big part of it. And I think we forget that most virtual platforms, whether it's Zoom or WebEx or Teams or whatever you're using, do now allow for breakouts. I know some didn't historically, but all the platforms I've been using do. Yeah, some of them were a little slow to come on with that, but others are great. And then also, you know, especially in the government space, people are concerned about using Zoom, and yet there is Zoom government, which has a much higher security protocol. So there are platforms you can use for these. And then what about the socializing? So we want to keep the culture of a company alive, and we want to do it via, you know, whether it's cocktail hour or you let's have a photograph of, something that is unique to you that a show and tell any other ideas for creating that kind of camaraderie yeah so one of the one of the facilitation sessions i did with a client the client had picked out a theme for each day so one day it was wear your college jersey so or, or it could be the favorite college whatever it was it didn't have to be the one you went to the next day it could be wear your favorite sports team 
um, I like doing a happy hour, but I keep saying to people, you don't have to drink in a happy hour. You can just be, we'll, we'll just have some fun, have a cup of coffee, grab a glass of water. No, nobody cares what's in that glass. So just having you know the chance to do something, let's let's meet the grandkids, let's have that photo. Like you say, suggested showing a photo. Um, one of my friends, her husband's team did a scavenger hunt. On on and online, but that needs takes a lot of preparation, doesn't it? Didn't. It really didn't take a lot of preparation. It was 10 items, and you would say, All right, bring me a VHS tape. And everybody ran around the house. Uh, trying that's to interesting. You know, do you still have a VHS tape in your house. Yes, one. <laughs> But it was on the wrong floor. I couldn't get there quickly enough. Uh, yes, it depends what age your team is. But, oh, that's a fun one. Run yeah. around your house and find me. Hmm. You got three nice points, one. two points and one point, And then the highest number of points, they sent them like a, you know, a coffee gift card or something. Um, one of my friends got me turned on. We do a thing called jackbox.tv. And it's, it's, a, it's a fun game that you can do online, but everybody plays on their phones. So you get the code, you log in, and everybody's playing individually on their phones, but it's showing up on the main screen. So you can do that in a Zoom call or a Teams or whichever you want. Um, but it's just a way for everybody to be doing something. I, we really need to get away from every time we meet together, it's about work. We need to have some fun, even if it's once every two weeks for a half an hour, just something that's some levity. Or, you know, like I said, the scavenger hunt was just fun. There's different things you can do that it doesn't have to be fully... We're all focused on work. Oh my goodness, here we go, another meeting. Something that I think is interesting about leadership style is a leadership style, let's say someone who is a delegator or authoritative might have worked okay in an in-person world. But in a virtual world, we want coaches, we want facilitators. Are you finding that something you can teach leaders to be in a virtual world? I think you can. It comes to the idea of you have to give up control. Um, but I've always been about that, right? You don't, as the team lead, you don't have to facilitate facilitate every meeting. You can facilitate one, then one of your colleagues can, somebody on your team can, then you facilitate the third one, you give it to another person. This is how we grow and develop our people. So if we're not giving up that control, why don't you ask two people to plan a, um, a happy hour one night or a, you know, a Wednesday, Wednesday get together, whatever you're gonna call them, but you don't have to be in charge of planning everything. And I think sometimes that's why these things don't happen because the fear is, oh my goodness, it's more work for me. When you have all these creative, bright minds on your team, why wouldn't you ask one of them to do it? Give everybody a time. There are lots of folks out there be like, man, these meetings are dull and boring. We got to do something different. Well, cool, go and do it. That's great. Yeah. Uh, but you have to give up the you have to give up control. You have to give up the reins, and that's not always so easy for folks. You know, you just always articulate things so well, Melissa, in terms of teaching leaders to coach, because again, you might think as a leader that you're checking in with someone and being caring, and that individual might perceive that to be your micromanaging me. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think talking about what well, we jokingly say, well, what is it everybody hates to be micromanaged? What's often the first thing people do when they become a frontline supervisor? micromanage oh, particularly virtually because we feel if we're not checking in with you all the time it's like big brother i can't see the whites of your eyes right <laughs> I, can't I, can't that. I can't see the whites of your eyes well no that's okay so mm. right being able to do that i think for me i keep trying to say with coaches it's so important when you're coaching your own employees and your team members and mentoring them it's about the questions how is it going is really not a very useful question Tell me two things you're working on right now that you're experiencing success. What's one thing you'd like to go back and do differently this week? Uh, what's one thing I'm doing that's helping, helping you and providing value? What's one thing I could do differently that would enable your success? So it's targeted. It's not, how's it going? Which is really, it's, to me, it's like great job. Great job is really not a very useful statement. What did they do that was great? Tell them some concrete feedback. Um, one of the I'm teaching coaching and mentoring right now to to a specific organization, and you know one of the questions I try to get them to under, to use is on a scale of one to ten, where are what's your comfort level with this project right now or whatever the area is? Well, I'm a six. Okay, so that's great. Tell us what what evidence do you have to support your six? What kinds of things are are getting you there? Okay, and now what would it take us to move from a six to an eight? Not a six to a 10, I can't get to a 10, I don't know what that looks like right now, but, but two numbers. If they say four, four to six, five to seven, whatever it is. And so what do we need to do to move that from a six to an eight? What would an eight look like? 
what concrete things would be happening for that to be an eight? Okay, so let's talk about that path of how to get there. Because coaching is not about me telling you. Coaching is about me questioning and guiding you, providing you, because you have the, you have the answers, you're the one with the knowledge. I'm just going to poke the right questions. And Melissa, do you recommend people do a personality assessment as a leader. I like DISC just because it's very quick, it's very easy, it helps me understand the personality style. Is there a particular one that you like to use that you recommend, particularly for leaders who you want to encourage to become coaches? So I'm an MBTI master practitioner. I appreciate I appreciate MBTI because it's about whole self and not just work. Uh, and I do under, I appreciate that when you can really get people to understand, this is about free will choice. I have the choice to behave however I want, but I have a tool belt and I have a natural tendency. So my, I'm an ESFJ, so I'm about extroversion. Okay, so tell us for people who have never heard what that is. So an E is an extrovert. So it's about so energy preference. Where do you get your energy from? Extroverts get their pre their energy typically from being with people. You know, that's why they're talking in front of you. They're, they're thinking, they speak to think. People with a preference for introversion, their preference is the idea that I'm, I, I really prefer to be in here. If I can help it. I'll speak, I'll think, and then I'll speak up there. Um, their preference is for being more on their own or with a very small group. So that would be in the tool belt. The second letter is around how, how do you get your energy? I mean, how do you get your ideas? Are your ideas big picture? Are you more based on intuition? What's the process in which you're engaging with that, that taking those information in? And then the... Um, and you're an S, which means an you're S a is details. S is about details. In the weeds, can't see it, taste it, touch it, all the numbers, all of that. Um, and then the third letter is around what is your way of dealing with um, making decisions? Not the quality of your decisions, but just how you make them. Uh, folks that are a T tend to be pe problem first, people second. It's just business. We, you know, It's about making the decision around what is the right thing to do right now? What is, what is the judicious thing to do? Um, but it's about problem first, people second. Folks that are an F, is about feeling. It's more about is there peace in the valley, harmony in the valley. It's people, people first, problem second. So, and it's not that you and I as an S and an F could come up with the exact same answer. It's how we went about doing it. And the last letter is about what people see. It's your public face. So as a J, for me, that means judging. People will see how I make decisions. It's like we do, we joke about the SJ moan, which is that you'll say to me, Melissa, I need you to do such and such. Really? Do I need to do? Oh, fine. I'll do it. So it's, I got to moan, but I'm still going to do it. Jay is about making decisions. You see people sort of, you know, done. You told me it was due at two o'clock. I got it into you at 12 o'clock. I'm done. Whereas P is much more open. The public face is you see people taking in information. So it's, I'm going to do that. That's a really great question. Let's ask that. Oh, look, squirrel. And it's just this idea they go to another topic. And it's not because they're trying to be difficult. It's just that, oh, this piece of information just came into my mind. And that's really interesting. And I'd like to pursue that. So I like it. But I try to get people to understand. Because people will say, well, I can do both. Well, of course you can. You have free will choice. At the end of the day, you have tools in the tool belt, which are the automatics to reach for. I know how to be quiet. But sometimes I have to think to myself, OK, Melissa, stop talking. This is not the time for you to engage. And so that's me pulling a different tool out that isn't my natural one. And because the virtual world is in a way quite artificial, so here are you and I, if we were in a room having this conversation, there would be certain cues. We have to be, and you said it earlier, so much more intentional as leaders, if we're going to engage our teams, motivate our teams, and we can't rely on what we just did. So that's a huge part of what you're doing, what I'm doing. Melissa, if people want to reach out to you, Wise Ways Consulting, um, how do they do it? You can catch me at Melissa at wisewaysconsulting.com. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Wise, or Melissa Wise Ways. I almost forgot what my handle was. Uh, <laughs> it can happen. Yeah, and, I, and, and also at the website, which is www.wisewaysconsulting.com. The one okay. thing I would say, just one yes, thing, and that is about cameras. And I know folks go, I don't have to turn my camera on all that. One of the things that we're missing in terms of the emotional intelligence, in terms of the facilitation is 
if we're not on gallery mode, which I call, I'm, I'm going to date myself, I call it Brady Bunch mode. If we're yeah. not on that, that way of seeing people, we miss their cues. We miss being able to see, oh, Nadia wanted to say something, or, oh, I'm done, it's not my turn. You know, or being able to see whose box is now darkened because they're, they've are they taken themselves off mute. So I know we get frustrated with the cameras. I keep saying to people in classes when I'm with them, this is a no judgment zone. I don't care. As long as you have clothes from the waist up, <laughs> you know, let's meet the cat, let's meet the grandchildren, it doesn't matter, but yes. we need to see each other. And this that is, is so valuable, and of course, I, when I'm having a meeting, what I say to people or a session, I say preferably with your cameras on. And Melissa, the reason I say preferably is I would like people's cameras to be on, but I don't want people to not join because for some reason they absolutely can't have their camera on. So I don't, and I don't know your thoughts around this, I don't embarrass people for not ha having their cameras on, but to your point, let's encourage it. And I think it's valid to say this is a meeting where all cameras are on. Now you now we've covered all the, the really heavy stuff. You can turn you turn them off if you need to. And if, for example, you don't have your camera on, what I recommend is that you say, I'm not having my camera on today because, and a lot of people have computer bandwidth issues or just at least explain it. Because there's only, something, you know, if people do that, then I understand. Right. So the other thing that I am finding fascinating in this is, you know, 18 months later, we're hurtling along into the second year of COVID, so to speak, is when I do a session and I tell people by looking into the camera, I am looking at Melissa. If I look down at Melissa, I can see Melissa, but it doesn't look like I'm looking at her. Right. I still get, wow, I didn't realize that. So if it can be right. a of takeaways from today, but don't forget, look into the camera and it's counterintuitive. It is. That's why when I always try to take the, the people that are in the class, they've got their cloud, their cameras on and I put them to the top instead of being at the bottom. So I can see them and I'm forced to look up. Try to say to people too, if you're working off two cam off two screens, figure out where your camera is. Because if you're going to coach people, but you're looking at this, this camera or this screen, because that's where you're getting your information from, but your camera's here, that doesn't work. There's no connection. So really understanding your devices. So a, a couple of things and so important. So if you are leading a team, both virtual and in hybrid, I'm going to ask Melissa to give her her three top tips. I will summarize it because I think this is so essential. We are having to have a virtual component of our lives going forward. You may be back in the office, but there's still a couple of people you're going to be communicating with virtually. So Melissa's tips, then Nadia's tips, and then please reach out to us, Melissa. I'm also going to invite you. I do a monthly power hour where people can ask you questions. And I'd love you to join me on that just because you are a mine of information. Every time I talk to Melissa, I learn something new. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to be a part. That would be great. So Melissa's tips on virtual and hybrid communication. So what I would say is be vulnerable, right? Be willing, especially as a manager, as a leader, be willing to be vulnerable. It's not going to be the same as it was when you were in person. It's just not. So if we're expecting everybody else to learn new strategies and new techniques, so do you. And don't be afraid to say to your team, what's working and what's not? How can we do things differently? What do we, you know, how do we create an environment that's going to work for all of us? What are your top suggestions? And then we can create that together because the team charter that we had when we were in person may not look the same today, right? It may be completely different. So I would say be vulnerable and open to new things. Um, I would say ask questions of the people you're working with. You know, ask them what's going to work and, and to share control. So have people do different events, have people sign up for a monthly event. It doesn't have to all be about work. Uh, and we really need to be purposeful and intentional about finding ways to bring some levity or interaction that's not focused on the agenda and mission success. Melissa, superb. My last thoughts to all of you are around, as Melissa said it earlier, be intentional. I think if we learned anything through this period, it's to take ourselves off autopilot. We can't just dial in and expect that things are going to magically work out. 
Um, Melissa, I recently did a hybrid session and there was a camera on one side of the room and a computer and the organizers thought, oh, this will be magical. So there's 20 people in the room and there's five people virtually and somehow the virtual people will just be part of the session. Right. Unless you've got your technology set up, unless someone is actually manning the computer, That's you have to make it a hybrid experience. Yeah. You need somebody there manning it. I remember the first time, and this was way before COVID, you know, you'd be in a room for 30 people doing a class that's highly participatory and you've got one person dialing in and they're dialing in over a speaker in the roof. <laughs> Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah. Uncomfortable. They were like, yeah, we know what we're doing, but they couldn't hear everything. And then when they had a group activity, that person would have to phone in to somebody in the group's mobile phone and they would put them on speaker so that table could hear what was. It was just... Torture. And, you know, it reminds me of if you think about when you watch a television show, if you watch a late night comedian or you watch that television show is for the television audience. If you think of the Academy Awards or the Grammys, it's for the television audience. The in-person audience is really there as a prop. Right. But they have cameras and it's situated for the millions of viewers. But a so, training pass is the other way around. Right. right. It's group activity. It's the other way around. It's for the people in the room. And then I don't know what we're doing with you for that couldn't figure out exactly. how to get in here. Number one, we're going to have to sort the technology. You spoke about a charter, standard operating procedures. Hmm. The whole idea is we have to create something new because it's nothing quite like we've ever done it before. And for people who had virtual sessions, and one thing I spoke to a learning and development head of one of the Fortune 500 companies recently, and she said to me, Nadia, we're not trying to do hybrid anything because it doesn't work. So either we're all on camera and we're doing it virtually or we're all in person, but it just doesn't quite work. I have so, done three in-person sessions since uh, April of last year. And two of them, I'm sorry, four, three of them were for firefighters. And so they they were already on site. And the other one was spouses of, you know, three and four star generals and this, they were coming in. So it was a small group. But other than that, everything is hybrid. And I have clients, or not hybrid, I'm sorry, virtual. And I have clients telling me that they will remain virtual to at least, at least the end of calendar year 2022. So this is where we're all going. And if you're watching us live, if you're watching us recorded, just reach out to us if you have any questions or you have obstacles or you're dealing with this. Melissa, I don't know if you can answer this question. I know you work with the military. What have people been feeling about Afghanistan? Is that something you're in direct contact with? Is something that's coming out? Because as facilitators, we are in touch with our audiences. And we know during COVID, people experienced loss and pain, even if it wasn't personal. It might have been a family member, a significant other, or a child who was at school, no longer at school, or stress. What are people in the military going through as this horrific situation in Afghanistan is unfolding? Well, and I worked in Afghanistan two years ago. So I know that. So for me, um, it's it's emotionally exhausting um, just because I'm you know, I'm in contact with a couple of people that were in a class there who have now come to the U.S., but they have family there. So we're trying to find ways for for them to bring you know to get people over here on the civ visas, and, and it's. I mean, people are exhausted, but there are there's a large community of folks who are working very hard to get their interpreters, their interpreter families, the journalists they work with, the subject matter experts they work with, all of that out of the country. So people are. I, I don't want to talk about the politics of it. That's not my. It's not my gig. Um, but the actual human capital. There's a. I mean, there's an incredible amount of empathy for people. This is not. This is nothing to do with them. And and they. Were, the community is just working very, very hard to get people out. So you were in Afghanistan two years ago. I mean, paint some kind of picture for us. What was it like? Because all we're seeing are these horrific pictures on television. But for you going in as a facilitator, being there for a period of time, how was it? Uh, I would say I felt very safe um, because there's a high, there that time was a very high level of security on the on the um, installation at the embassy. So I felt very safe. People were working. You know, I was doing work for USAID, so we were working with folks who were trying to make a difference. Um, and so we interacted with host nationals. 
as well as folks from around the world who work for aid and the other agencies. Um, there was just a feeling of trying to do, to stay safe, but to do good. We well, in Kabul. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 me, so you watching this is different for any of us watching this. Well, there's a lot of us that are in the same situation, but yeah, it's a, a um, and as an empath, it to me, I'm just, I, I yeah, it's the energy level for me has just been so exhausting. And I was only there for three weeks. I can't, I can't imagine what for people who have been there for you know two, three, four, five, ten years working there. So yeah, there's a huge amount of um, connection, I think, and and concern. But just trying to do what you can. I mean, right now the the people are looking for things to be sent to the refugees that are the Afghans that are now in in Qatar at the base there. But even just toothpaste, toothbrushes, teddy bears for the kids. So as Americans, they, of course, you can go online, look at places to support. But it takes a moment to go, you know, there, but for the grace of God. And I think until you actually, um, first world problems, until you actually understand that what's going on and the level of fear for people and that, that you know, the, the, the Taliban was, was threatening to shoot your families. So... Mm -hmm. That some of the stuff I read online, I just I have to I have to walk away because I just get so frustrated that people have lack the empathy to understand. Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. What would you do if you were in that case? Because I would say the majority of us have never been there, never been there, in where somebody is threatening to kill or rape our fam our children, our daughters, and our wives. Mm -hmm. So what would you do? You know. So I would just ask people to have a, a level of empathy and and reach out to your to your veterans. If you have friends that were there, just reach out and say, Hey, I'm thinking about you because there's a, a level of, of um, uh, just exhaustion. Maybe a level of exhaustion and burnout and, and maybe ignorance. Ooh. I recently interviewed an author called Daniel Levin and he's written a book called Proof of Life and he spoke about going into Syria and he speaks about Afghanistan and he says, you know, we see it, but we watch it in a sanitized way, read about, understand, try and, and as you say, isn't part of what we try and teach the ability to see the world from another person's point of view. But Melissa started off our conversation today when I said, Melissa, you're such an extraordinary facilitator and executive coach, and you really work with individuals to help them come to terms with themselves and to bring out the best in themselves. And your methodology is remarkable. So just thank you so much for this conversation. I could always carry on talking to you endlessly. I look forward to the next one. So right now I say we're a virtual hybrid. I think we'll probably be having this conversation for a while. Yep, I agree. I agree very much. Okay. From our virtual world to yours, wishing you a wonderful rest of the weekend and month. I'm in conversation with the wonderful Melissa Davies. Her company is Wise Ways Consulting. She is wise and she has many ways of helping you. I'm Nadia Belchick. My website is Nadia Speaks. Look forward to seeing you at our next Power Hour. Thank you.